Hey people, this is Amani. Welcome to my podcast, Chat to Amani, hashtag Brain Babble, a little offshoot from our app fight for Amani Instagram page. I hope to document and share the highs and the lows and everything in between of my life since being diagnosed with incurable brain cancer. So today's episode is extra special because I have a guest and for once it's not my mum and dad and no, I didn't pay him. It is Tom Parker, best known for being a member of The Wanted. Do you want to introduce yourself? Because people aren't going to believe me. <laughs> Hello, everyone. These northern dulcet tones are piercing your ears. <laughs> so what me and Tom have in common is that we both have a GBM4, so glioblastoma multiforme grade 4. It's a type of brain cancer. So I thought it'd be perfect to get him on the podcast and ask him a few questions and like share our experiences. So I guess the first thing that people would want to know is probably what were your first symptoms? How did you know that you were unwell? So initially I thought that I might have had a concussion or just fallen over. So I took myself to the hospital and they they just palmed it off. They were just like, oh, I'm sure it's nothing. And then anyway, I went home and I had a big mark on my forehead and my wife took a picture of it, funny enough. And she was like, I think something might have happened. But obviously, because I don't remember yeah. anything from the... I had a seizure, but obviously I didn't know at that time it was a seizure. Never had anything like that before. And then uh, probably six weeks later, I was away in Norwich, actually, with uh, fa- like with Kelsey's family. And I just had, ended up having a 15-minute grandma seizure. And, well, Kelsey just said she was just remembers looking at me going, oh, my God, I don't even know. I don't know what's happening. She couldn't stop me shaking. I was just, I had no recollection of it. So before the seizure, did you have, did you feel unwell at all? Or was it literally at, completely out of the blue? I knew something wasn't right. I just couldn't put my finger on it. Yeah. I remember going to the doctors. I went to, I took myself to the hospital. I was like, I don't know what it is, but there's something not right. And Kelsey actually thought I had depression. Um, cause I just couldn't stop fixating on something that wasn't right. And I knew it. I knew in myself that there was something wasn't right. Uh, but obviously, because I'd already had a seizure, but I didn't know I'd had a seizure because, you know, obviously I, I I didn't remember him. So after the second one, she, Kelsey was uh, was there. And then she took me to Norwich Hospital where they told me I had a brain tumour. I was like, pardon? And, and that was, I was just in total shock yeah. then. Just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't fathom it. It's like, I can't have a brain tumour, I'm 32. Mm. I think that's what I was going to ask you next was not only how you reacted because I know for myself I don't know I didn't know whether it was my age or just because it was too traumatic but I just didn't understand it didn't really mean anything to me I was just like okay not great but yeah you know I didn't have that moment where I was like wailing you know you see on tv when someone breaks really bad news like it wasn't like that so I was wondering for you like you said the same thing you were just like what how did your friends and family react? Did you get to a point where you understood it and then went and told them? Um, yeah, I, it was, I don't know, it was, everything was such a, like a blur. Yeah, I say that all the time. I just don't really remember that much about that period. I think it's because I wasn't familiar with my surroundings as well. Because obviously we was in Norwich, so I ended up in Norwich Hospital. And yeah, I just remember Kelsey coming in visiting and then obviously we sat down with the oncologist. And he was like, yeah, your husband's got a brain tumour. I remember just sitting there with her at the side of me. And she was like, what do you mean you've got a brain tumour? I just, I couldn't compute it. And I was like, okay, is it bad? He was like, yep, it's a stage four. I was like, how many stages is there? Four. I was like, oh, God. That's not something you want to be at the top end of, no. (laughs) No. That's like me when they, so that I was at home afterwards, so I'd had the biopsy and like we were waiting, sat waiting for a phone call. And like I said, I didn't really understand anything about it, still hadn't really processed it. I, I apparently had conversations with the doctors, but because of COVID, I was like by myself where they'd said potentially it's cancerous, like nothing really processed with me. It's not till I've recently kind of sat down with my family and like pieced together, missing piece of the puzzle. But, um, like you said, I just didn't understand it to explain to anyone. When they said stage four, like you, I just knew it was the worst. Yeah. That's it. I didn't need to know any more. I was just like, this is not good. And that is exactly it. I think, you know, I've never experienced anything really to do with like brain cancer. But as soon as you really were stage four, I was like, that doesn't sound good to me. 
Yeah, because that's what I was actually wanted to ask. Did you know anything or hear anything? Because now that we're in this group of people, it's a lot more common and so many people die from it. But I'd never really heard anything about it. I'd never heard of GBM. Had you before? Never. I mean, my nan had lung cancer and she unfortunately passed away from that. Oh. Um, that was like 10 years ago. That's that's really my only experience with cancer. Um, so yeah, then when they said that, stage four, I was like, how can it be stage four? What? Yeah. So I was just in total shock. I was like, how can it be so far progressed? Mm. And I feel like the other thing is that I had this kind of like impression that cancer is very scary and very serious, but the treatment is pretty good for it. I was like, it's going to be okay. Like I was scared, but I wasn't like, I don't know, death and all of that stuff didn't really oh, come into the equation. I would like to say yeah. the same, but I was a mess. Really? I was just like, because obviously we just had Bo, our little one, we had a oh, radio. Yeah. So I was just like, I can't leave them behind. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like the, I had just a fear of God in me. Yeah. And I just could not get death out of my mind. Mm. It was just awful. Yeah, because yeah, I think I did a bit of research <laughs> and I saw in, like an article that you said you went through a period of time where you were in a like quite a dark and difficult place i'm assuming that that was after the diagnosis are you like yeah. happy to talk with me kind of Absolutely. what went through your mind yeah um i just remember just just thinking i've got to be around for the kids mm. like i can't die i'm 32 years old yeah like i don't understand i just could not it was just so difficult to compute I just could, and, I, and do you know what it was i just i was failing to accept that this was a problem yeah. for me you know, and I was like, no, I can't have. They must have made a mistake. Turns out they didn't make a mistake. Yeah. I had a GBM4. Yeah. I think for me, I had, like I said, I was in, like you, a bit in denial. I Apparently I got in the car after one of the meetings with one of the doctors and said, oh, it's okay. I'll be okay. I'll get through it. I just kind of brushed it off. And then, like you said, the reality kind of hits you. Like, yeah. this is very serious. It's in your brain. It affects kind of everything that you know everything that you are like affects your personality like your confidence just like you said you're walking you're talking all that kind of stuff and it's just terrifying but I think for me like I said I brushed it off initially it was there was one point where I just was like this is not a joke anymore it was where I was standing with my dad and he was like crying and I said my dad never cries and he was like stood with me and hugging me and he was like this is all wrong like you're meant to bury me I'm not meant to bury you and like my heart just broke oh god yeah you know you're saying as a dad you want to be around for your kids that's like heartbreak but then for me i was like that's how you think life goes like no one wants to lose a parent but then for a parent you always think oh you'll outgrow your kids you'll outlive your kids and then you'll understand because we're in the same position but it's so hard to articulate to explain to other people what goes through your head what hundred percent just craziness i feel like it's, it's like a, a nightmare like it's I literally had, like a living nightmare isn't it yeah it was like falling through and like so many other things happened and i was really struggling i actually went to like therapy and i was explaining everything that happened the diagnosis and everything else and the therapist turned around to me and was like oh that sounds a bit like a nightmare and i was like well it's not a nightmare this is my life Reality, yeah. like this this is what i have to live with i don't wake up from it and it's all gone away mm. But you have to keep going. Exactly. Thing is, it's not like you even melt into nothingness or you just carry on with it. And you just get on with it, do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's kind of the way that I've just kind of wanted to focus my mind into just going, okay, you've got kids, you've got a wife, mm. you know, you've got a family. Yeah, like it gives you a purpose. Exactly. That's why I'm always like people that don't have like a tight family union or don't have that where do they find their strength from you do it for other people because it's so difficult that you have moments where you're like if i didn't have my mum and dad if i didn't have my sisters i would just give up it'd be easier surely i mean i could sit I in bed all day and just lie there and just wallow in self-pity i really yeah. could that's why i like try to keep busy and i'm sure you're the same because like you said what's the other option is just to sit in a corner exactly yeah and I know that um, with like radiotherapy and stuff, I lost part of my hair. I wear a scarf, so it's not as big of an issue, but um, I think you, you lost your hair yeah. too. Do you, yeah. Do you know what? It was just more over in the sides where I think they went in with yeah. the radio. Um, did you struggle with that more because you were in the public eye? Did that, was that? It did bother me a little bit, to be honest. But when I shaved it all off, I was like, actually, it doesn't look too bad. <laughs> I was quite impressed I feel like it's important to talk about because it's always seen as more of a female worry because I'm on steroids I'm not sure if you are but that causes, dexamethadone yeah 
So that causes, yeah, no, terrible. Get off. <laughs> I'm off. Him. But um, it causes like the water retention, the weight gain, and that was like a very huge insecurity for me. Oh my god! Me. When I was on dexamethasone, I just could not stop eating. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Yeah. Literally, I was just going to the kitchen, just eating, and Kelsey was like. You've just been to the kitchen and eaten. I'm like, no, but I'm hungry. I oh, couldn't stop the eating. The carb cravings are insane. insane. All I could think about was pizza, chips. I mean, I like pizza and chips normally, but when I was on those, whoo, that's all. I, all my texts when I was in hospital by myself to my family were like, okay, but there better be pizza when I get home and there better be chips <laughs> and like 8 million mozzarella sticks because I'm going to eat them all. <laughs> yes. I mean, that shit is the devil. Yeah. Like, honestly our oncologist and he was just like he was so adamant of us being off dexamethasone he was just like you need to get off this as soon as possible so we did yeah i've been trying for like a long long time and really really struggled every time i got to about two milligrams i would have like excruciatingly painful headaches and stuff and today actually was the first time i took 0.5 great yeah so slowly we're hoping that i'm you know, going to be able to because, like you said, everyone says that it's the devil's drug. Yeah. Like it, you need if you need it, you need it. But the side effects are just awful. That's why I was so nervous about this as well because I've become so self conscious because I know that I don't look like I used to look. Really? Yeah. Like, I think you look great. Oh, thank you, Tom. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> but um, but people don't realize that the impact on everything. You you're so right, and even you know, for a man as well. Like you know, I know w- uh, women probably feel. You know, with the hair and stuff like from chemotherapy. But even for a man, like, um, I was like, I can't lose my hair, surely. I was praying that it wasn't going to disappear. Anyway, I woke up one morning and went, oh, no, there was just one big patch at the side mm-hmm. here. I was like, no. Oh. I thought I was going to get away with it. I thought it wasn't going to leave. Um, anyway, it start, all started falling out. I was like, I'll just take me the clippers, get them off. And I just did it. I was like, actually, it doesn't look too bad. Yeah, you're rocking it. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Bit of a rock star look. Yeah. (laughs) So I know that also you've had like quite good news in the terms that your tumour has had some shrinkage. What treatment have you actually had so far? So we've been doing some private stuff as well as the NHS stuff. Yeah. Been doing uh, something called Avastin and then another drug called uh, Ipilumumab. I've not heard of those. No? No. So a Vastin basic, it's like a checkpoint here, but I don't actually know what that means. What does that even mean? That's like me. I just take the drugs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's it doing? I think like with the Avastin and the Ipiluma, it basically stops the communication between like the cancer cells and normal cells. I think that's right. I mean... It's okay. People aren't expecting us yes, to be doctors. I'm not an oncologist. Don't take our medical advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Straight. Please don't. <laughs> I don't. Like you said, with your radiotherapy... Did you find it quite an easy experience or a difficult experience? Because I was quite traumatised by it. I would walk around like when I was home and I'd smell the burning smell and I wouldn't be able to get rid of it. And the drives up to get radiotherapy, I would be almost in tears. Like mum would sometimes, like dad would have to stop the car. Mum would sometimes have to get in the back seat and like hold my hand the whole way there. And it wasn't that it was painful or, you know, it was just awful. Yeah, it was quite, um, it's quite, um, I was fatigued so much from it. And I remember just one night, I was laying in bed, and I just felt really, really sick. I'd not been sick at all on any treatment. Um, and then just a couple of days into the radio, laying in bed, just so tired. It's like, I, need to, I think I'm going to be sick. I didn't even make it to the toilet, just oh. all over the floor. Yeah, it was a mess. Yeah, no, it's, I had to take, like, anti-sickness medication Yeah, do you know what stuff. I was? It wasn't even touching the sides. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, gosh. So I think I was taking Domperidone for a little bit. And then, what's the other one called? On um, um, Dash, what is it called? Yeah, I think that's what it's called. It's like I said, bad memory. And bad memory, yeah. Not going to remember the long names of medication. Yeah. I just want to know why they make it so complicated. I know, yeah. I'm assuming you take anti-seizure medication. Yeah. I just call it anti-seizure medication. Why can't we just call it that? Why Do you take Kepra? We... Yeah, I take yeah. Kepra. Woo! <laughs> it's such a weird thing to bond over. So the next thing I was going to ask was, which you already touched upon, I guess. But what's your biggest fear? Uh, I mean, at first it was death. Because mm. um, I don't think anybody can really comprehend death until it's staring you in the face. Yeah. I've never really had to so ever acknowledge it. Um, so, yeah, that was one thing that I've really struggled to get my head around. Uh, but I've kind of come to terms with it a little bit that I'm going to fight it. Doesn't matter what the situation is, I'm you know, I'm going to get through this. Yeah. 
Because at first, then, then first initial weeks, I was like, I was literally looking at a clock going, how long have I got left? Yeah. And then now I'm kind of at a stage where I'm like, okay, we're doing it. We're doing treatment. We're doing everything we can. We're chucking everything at it. We're eating well, supplementing as much as we can. Just doing everything we can, really. So you feel like you're in a good place? Yeah, I feel I feel like I am, actually. It's just the arm and the leg movement is just driving me insane. Is that a recent thing that's gotten worse? Well, I think it's just been a consistently bad thing, to be honest. Okay. Whereas, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to do exercise as much as possible, just trying to get everything moving again and activated. I lost so much muscle in, like, my lats and stuff. Yeah. And in my uh, quads, just... It took me so long and I had a really bad limp for ages. And it's all, it's just starting to bounce back now. And like, I just guess I'm just curious because this is such a difficult time for you. Why you wanted to do a documentary? Why you wanted to let cameras in, in such a personal way? Do you know what? I think I've grown up, you know, over the last few years. And fortunately, you know, I've been in a position when I was in The Wanted where... I've been, we've been able to raise awareness for cancer across the board, whether it's brain tumours or, you know, lung cancer. And I just knew it was the right thing to do. I was just like, you know what? I want to get my story out there. This can happen to anyone at any age. Yeah. You know, I've got two kids, a wife, and if it can help one person's journey, then it was worth it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I just feel like you're, like, speaking <laughs> from my soul because I feel like the same way with like the podcasts or even just you know when I get stressed about it behind the scenes I just think but if I can help one person and like big part of the page when I started getting more involved in it because at first it was just kind of my mum updating people because a lot of people were interested I can't give you the exact figures of how expensive it is but it's it's very expensive like we're not we're not dropping those tablets on the floor (laughs) like they need to be locked away but obviously because you need to take them consistently it's a lot of money we don't have that kind of money so we decided that the best oh god it drives me insane the world's just a world where money yeah oh and there's yeah. drugs out there that can save people's lives i know it's and just it's so frustrating so, so so expensive like don't get me wrong i understand that it's probably expensive to find the drugs but i know that they're making their profit margins are huge oh yeah. so we started the gofundme page and it just took off we we set to get a hundred thousand that's what we were hoping for because that would last i don't know exactly i can't do the maths in my head because <laughs> never do the maths in my head, my head but definitely wouldn't be able to do it now <laughs> just within 24 hours we ha- actually had to stop it because we'd raised that much money really yeah it was that's insane great. and i think my mom always says it now because we were really stressed at the time because it's like you don't ever want to be in a position where you're kind of like asking people for money and it's like you're desperate you you, you know you're yeah in a I, know, I know what you mean it's like uncomfortable And everyone else was like amazed by how we were amazed too. We were so grateful, but it was just such like you just wish that you don't have to be in that position. Like it's amazing and it's incredible. The thing is, people should never be in that position. Exactly, and that's that's the one thing that I want to at least try and get out of this if we can. uh, uh, You know, doing the documentary and raising awareness for glioblastoma. Yeah, is that can we get better treatments on the NHS at the moment? Definitely, a hundred percent. Radiation and chemotherapy. I mean, that treatment hasn't changed in nearly 20 years for glioblastoma. It's shocking. I mean, there's got to be a yeah. better answer out there than just that. Yeah. And so th- when we raised the money, we actually, mum and dad decided to close the page once we got it. Because everyone was like, keep going, keep going. Because later on, if we need it, we might not have the same like response that we had, which is true. But it was just so much money. And like you said, we don't, we didn't know whether it was going to work for me. So you don't want to be holding all these people's money and not knowing if the treatment's even the mum was like we need to let people know where their money's going so that's where the fight for money page came from and then i wasn't really involved in it at all did you have to go to germany for it so my dad flew oh oh, i brought it back for him yeah so you you can do that i didn't have to go great um i don't think i've not been told that i can fly they said that i shouldn't yeah do you know what they've not really said anything about that to me i'm guessing not oh yeah i can't imagine yeah you know when your ears pop oh my gosh that now my brain will pop yeah literally (laughs) imagine that's the cure yeah yeah (laughs) the secret cure (laughs) <laughs> so that's what it started and then I wasn't really involved it was just kind of mum um, but then we were reaching so many people and a lot of people were interested and then that's where it's kind of snowballed into we were trying to get the signatures for the petition to increase the funding because it's I was, only 2% isn't it I can't believe that it's 
killing so many people especially young people i'm not saying it's not upsetting when older people pass away but you're talking about people being robbed of their youth and they're never getting the chance and you're still not investing the money why is that and that's when i was like something needs to be done something needs to change and like you said you you want to use your position and that small page it gave me it did it gave me like a kick up the backside to try and do something like I couldn't study anymore I wasn't working so that became like a little project me and my mum and like our family to push for those signatures and then it snowballed into the podcast trying to raise awareness for like symptoms and like we're doing now talking someone listening might be like because I didn't feel quite right either really did you but what, yeah, like I couldn't t- put my finger on it really yeah, but I hadn't. I didn't just have the seizure. I was sick before, like a couple of days before, and I lost like part of my peripheral vision. So yeah, I had a I've, I've heard this before. Actually, people losing part of the vision. Yeah, I guess I just I thought an interesting question to ask you would be: if you had a magic wand, what does your future look like? I don't honestly. I would give up everything as long as I've got my kids and wife in front of me. Yeah, you know, I don't. I don't care about material things. I'd live on the street yeah. if I had to. You know, I think once you're put in that position, you know, it puts everything in perspective. Yeah, you know, I've, definitely. I, I mean, I've never really been a materialistic person anyway, to be honest, but it really does put everything into perspective of what's important in life. Yeah, because that's another thing I was going to ask is now knowing like that your life has played out this way so far. Is there anything you would have done differently? No, do you know what? We had a pretty wild time in the ones. <laughs> I can you know, imagine, only imagine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm fortunate, you know, whatever happens with my journey, you know, I'm really fortunate to have been able to be in a position to be able to do the things that we got to do in the, when yeah. I was in the band. We got to travel the world, play in front of thousands of people. It was incredible. Yeah. You know, so I know that my kids will look back on that and be like, proud of dad, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think they'll even be, like I always say, no one knows what's going to happen for both me and you. We're kind of like, walking along a tightrope almost but I want to leave behind some sort of legacy like yeah. so if I can try and raise awareness if I can try and you know make a difference then at least something good has come out of something bad totally so I guess that's part of the reason why you wanted to do the document yeah like you said to see if you can help other people so maybe if not to sound morbid but even if it's like too late for us maybe other families yeah. you know if they hear about the medication that you're trying they didn't know about it like you said we had no idea no one sat down and gave us a manual like this is what you need to do yeah but maybe there can be a manual in the future to help people how have you found the nhs see i'm like really aware that it's something to be grateful for because if i had fallen ill in america for example everything costs a bomb i'd have to be like selling my kidneys or whatever yeah but i also i don't think the way they approach it especially with brain tumors is that great because it was very doom and gloom right from the start it was kind of like you're going to try chemo and radiotherapy but it's not a cure well that's great yeah like (laughs) Uh, that's not really what i want to wear to be honest with you and you know and it's going to be quite grueling and these are the side effects but we're gonna have to do it and then just it didn't work for me so once we got the news that obviously that nhs treatment that they offered hadn't worked i think not done anything at all it's actually grown (laughs) I can't believe that. Yeah. Even with radio. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so we didn't have any good news. Was that radio. because of a certain mutations within the guy, like the tumour? They never really sat and explained it. They just said, it's sorry to tell you, it's like progressed. <laughs> so then we were like, okay, now what do we do? <laughs> they could try another chemo, but like you said, the side effects are not great. Yeah, because I think there's different ones, isn't there? Yeah. T- Temazolamide. Is it Lomastine? Yeah. 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 So, Did they try? Um, no, so we didn't. I think at that point, we, mom and dad had done their research. Like I said, I recognise how privileged I am that my parents were able to under, like even understand English because not everyone does. To yeah. sit there and do, or have a laptop to sit there and do all this research to know that there was an option in Germany. So the oncologist had actually mentioned the trial drug before. And I think if I remember rightly, that was in America, but you had to go and join the trial. But I wasn't well enough to go and join their trial. But... Um, we actually applied on compassionate grounds to see if we could get it, but they said no. So then... Um, I'm really surprised about that, because yeah. usually they, I, I, I didn't realise they were allowed to say no. I, I think a lot of people thought that we would get it because I'm quite young. Yeah. Um, but 
they didn't. So then we had to look elsewhere and it was Germany that offered the Onctual one. Right. Pretty much straight away, my parents and everyone was like, okay, so how do we get it? It's just tablets. We needed it. Yeah, so it's four tablets once a week. Great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's stable? Yeah, well, so far. Great. So far. And okay. when did they say that they would probably expect reduction, if anything, or um, at least... So the first time we went, there was still... Um, it had grown a bit but it had grown by such a small amount they were saying it was probably that time period where you weren't having any treatment at all yeah so obviously i'd stopped the chemo stopped the radiation and i wasn't taking any child drugs at all and they were saying that if it left untreated in four months i'd be dead pretty much is what they said so then when we went i started taking the drug and they scanned it again it had grown but they were saying it's still showing promise because if it wasn't doing anything you're not having any other treatment yeah um, it should have grown by a lot more. And then I have had a small amount of shrinkage since I've been on it, but it's not enough that they class it as shrinkage. It has to be like 30% or something. Right, right. Um, but I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll as long as it's it. not growing. Yeah, by exactly. Whatever it is, 10%. Or... Yeah. So we're hopeful. I mean, that's all you can be. Yeah. Um, but I think other people that we know that have taken it, they started seeing promise by like nine months, they were saying. Really? So obviously it's not like it's disappeared but like as in started seeing that it was doing something yeah 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 um, so I'm not actually sure how... and is the ONC just for the H32K7 yeah so mutation? it's specific for that or yeah. it's more common in children I think, the H3 I think mutation so. all I know is that the Onk is just designed for that mutation so a yeah. lot of people can't take it which is sad because if it is a drug that works for a lot of people yeah then... I remember when my oncologist told me I asked him about it and he was like no it's for uh, paediatric I was like is there anything out there that will work? Yeah. And are you still okay. getting scans? Yeah. So the from um, so the NHS they're good in that sense. They still will do my scans. They've not like said okay because you're not using our treatment plan. Yeah. Bye. Um. So they still will monitor me, but they're not involved. So we have kind of the issue sometimes where it's like if I'm experiencing something and you know we we need help, they're like oh but you're on a trial drug. Could it be that? But. <sighs> So anything that goes wrong, it's quickly like... It's always blamed. straight to that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's a bit difficult. Overall, like I said, I recognise that I'm very lucky to have the NHS. But I don't, I don't personally, I don't, I don't want to beat around the bush about the NHS. Like, yeah. I think they've been great, but I think there's m a massive improvement needed in... Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, ...in treatment for brain tumours, I really do, because I think yeah. the, the funding for it is shocking, 2%. Yeah. Of cancer spend on brain tumors. It's the biggest killer of under 40s. I couldn't believe it when I was like, when I got to a place where I was ready to like listen to these statistics and stuff. Yeah. And you just think that, well, why is it not highlighted more? Why are the government just making all these empty promises about all this money? They can find the money if they need to. They do it time and time again for pointless things. Well, why is it one not? thing's called Brexit. Oh. They've just found a... Uh, <laughs> Multi, multi millions of pounds to leave the European Union for no reason. Yeah, I know. It's just, and you're just like, you're talking about saving lives. Literally. Like, put your money where your mouth where, is. Yeah, exactly. And put it where it matters. Literally, that. Yeah. But I, I feel like it's it's been like 20 years or more since, like, the I know they did the, um, the Optune was, that was approved, wasn't it, uh, in 2010, I want to say? Uh, we were actually doing the Optune for a little bit. So you didn't have any surgery, just a no, biopsy? Just a biopsy, yeah, yeah. same. So yeah, they did the biopsy and then they came back and they were like, so it's, these are mutations. Uh, so we did like a private biopsy as well as the NHS one. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so it was it was very detailed actually, um, which was good because it gave us a bit more of a structure to, okay. be like, to, to attack uh, the tumour with treatment. Um, so yeah. Kind of where we're at. Yeah. So is there anything else that you... Other than our joint bonding of alarms going off 24-7. <laughs> yeah. 80 million different <laughs> medications to pop. <laughs> that literally drives me insane when it gets to like 6 o'clock and my alarm goes off. Oh, I can't take tablets again. <laughs> God. Oh, it's so tiring. It really is. I'm literally just like... Sometimes I'm like, oh, can I even be bothered? I know it's, it sounds so pointless. I think to other people listening, they'll be like, it's just taking a few tablets. Yeah. But when you have to do it like 24 just, times Do you know what it is? Day, it's a mental thing, yeah. isn't it? It's just being constantly re constantly reminded that you've got a brain tumour. Yeah. It's like 100%. a mental game. 
because that's what I say like because I feel like I'm in a place where when I'm having good days or good moments I appreciate it more than I would have before because I'm so appreciative that I'm still here and I'm still with my family and I'm able to enjoy those moments but then it'll be like I'll get up from my chair too fast then the whole world moves someone has to come and like steady me and then I'm reminded instantly well you can enjoy yourself but it's only temporary it's not like before when I was at uni like you stay awake all night stay awake all day yeah. have a little nap and like nothing would bother you there's always like this looming cloud over me yeah there is always yeah, a reminder mean? whether it's an alarm or a medication like even when you're feeling good yeah it's just like so tiring even with the the drug that I'm taking because I haven't had um, I have had some feel like the idea that potentially I'm going to have to take that forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah. It's just so upsetting, like, because with other, maybe they will find a cure. Hopefully they will. But with other cancers, they, most people will get the treatment. And then if it works for them, then they'll have a scan every 10 years. Yeah. Now, this seems like it's going to be a constant, over, yeah. Yeah, forever and ever. So even if I get to a point where I can study again, if I can work again, you know, if I get to a point where I can, you know, get married, have my own kids, it's always going to be like this big, like looming cloud over me, something that you have to tell everyone, oh, by the way, just a warning, it could come back. It just seems like you can't escape it. It's so suffocating. A hundred percent. I definitely couldn't agree more with you. But it feels like a cure is on the horizon. I don't know why, but I go on Twitter a lot and <laughs> type in glioblastoma. Yeah. And it just feels like there's always something new happening every day. Like new studies, new developments. Yeah. And it like, yeah, I just feel like they're on the cusp of it. Yeah. And it's not quite there yet, even with like the immunotherapy stuff. It's not quite clinically proven to cure yeah. glioblastoma. But it does feel like it's heading in the right direction. Yeah, because I feel like don't hear about it until you're in it. So part of me is like, well, maybe it seems like that just because we're constantly researching and maybe, you know, we're looking out for it. So we keep seeing these positive things and maybe it's not or we keep seeing these negative things. But for the average like Joe, they're not there out there on their laptops yeah. sort of constantly looking. So they don't know. How did you find that, um, them initial like few months of like totally focused on trying to find an answer because that's what I've been like I'm mean, like right I need to find the answer see because I think maybe partly it's because of my age I just didn't want to know so I used to get actually quite upset in the meetings with my like neuro-oncologist when, when my dad was there because he had already been looking and seen that for a lot of people radio and chemo doesn't really work so he was already before I'd even started my radio properly looking at all these other options and I would get upset and say well why are you assuming it's not going to work for me like it is but yeah. obviously dad and mum and like my family have seemed like they're really on it yeah basically they are and thank goodness that they were because as soon as we got the news that it progressed then they were ready for the next step but at that time that was terrifying to me because in my head I was like no we're going to get the chemo and the treatment and that's what people do and that's works with people I wasn't someone that like googled and I didn't google like prognosis or anything like that I was just like nope don't really want to know I mean I did ask in the meetings but I didn't go down the internet like yeah, rabbit yeah. hole I would rather the doctor have told me see do you know what's funny actually my oncologist um, he always asks me how are you feeling like because and he said that's a really important part like for you to keep me updated with how do you feel because if you feel well then you probably are well Yeah. you know but if you feel not you know, that there's, that there's a problem, then usually nine times out of ten there is a problem. He said, just as long as you keep me updated with how you're feeling, that's all I care about. Yeah. If you don't feel well, we'll do some investigation as to why. Yeah. And there usually will be a, a reason why. Yeah. Which I thought was really uh, interesting, actually. Because obviously, you know, before we found out it was glioblastoma, I knew there was, a, I knew him instinctively that there was a problem. I just obviously didn't know what it was. Yeah. And we, you do know, don't you? Like, you know in yourself that there's yeah. something not right, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. Did you find it, a lot of people were saying to me, oh, like, you know, you have to keep positive because that helps. Like, if you think positively, you'll have positive results. And I just used to be like, what kind of nonsense? Like, you don't understand, like, how difficult it is. And then there was, like, this pressure to be happy, to be, like, upbeat. And I feel like for you, it must have been even more so because you've got a wife and kids. Did you feel, like, pressure to kind of up and keep going? Was that a good thing or a bad thing? Because then you feel guilty when you have those days where you just, like, can't do anything. 100%. I mean, there was, there was times where I was, like, I physically could not get out of bed. I was just so exhausted from treatment. But... I also had a, like guilt as well because obviously Kelsey was not only dealing with her husband 
potentially dying, yeah. you know, and leaving her with two kids, two under two, mm. you know, for the kids as well, they were like, where's daddy? You know, mm. and, and and that lay heavy on my, like, on my mind, mm. you know, so I was like, right, I need to just make more of an effort to get up, be involved with a family. And I didn't want to spiral into this, like, I don't want to say depression, but, you know, just this, just sitting there doing nothing with my life. Do you know what I mean? Like, if I've got six months left to live, I, w- I want to be, I want people to go, at least he just got up and just got on with it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So just whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Do you feel like you're in a place now where you've like fully kind of accepted, fully understood, and you just want to make the most of whatever it is that's kind of to come? 100%. And I think for me, it was, I really struggled with the acceptance side of it. Yeah. I was like, no, I can't have a brain tumor. I can't. Mm. I'm 32. And that really, really took a lot for me to dig in and accept that. But that was a pro- like that was a going to be an ongoing problem probably for the rest of my life. Now, yeah. this is my life. Yeah, you know, and that that was really a tough pill to swallow. I was yeah. like, I can't do this forever. You know, I can't do this for the rest of my life. Just keep going to hospital. But oh yeah, it is it is what it is. That's that's your life, isn't it? Yeah, I literally had a hospital phobia before. Really? But that's why I appreciate so much that like you are recognising that you've got a following, you've got a position and that you can, you know, you do need, you can't just have a random person from the street just standing there and saying, I'm really sick, please government listen to me. Unfortunately, you need people that do have a presence that people are aware of. Like, it's horrible that this has happened to you, but at least you can do something 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 with it. Most people, they're not heard. You have a voice, you have a platform. Yeah, exactly. People will listen. Definitely one thing I want to be remembered for is going out there trying to find a cure for glioblastoma. That'd be a great, yeah. great epitaph. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's hope it's a long, in many, 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 many years. But either way, if that's to add to the list, mm. I'll take that too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just always thought, you know, you think about the NHS or doctors, how cool it is that they save lives on the regular. And just to think that maybe that we could be as, even a small part of trying to help save people's lives, I'll take it. 100%. Yeah. You know, it would be a great thing. Mm. Thank you. Oh, so it's a pleasure. Much. So honoured that, you know, you even took the time out. I'm sure you're very busy. No, oh, don't worry about it. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> it's just been... nice to talk to someone else that's yeah, going through a this similar is the situation. Kind of therapy that they, yeah. they need to prescribe. I really, really needed it, actually. Oh, you know, because a... when you're in a similar situation as yeah. someone else, you can at least, there's, there's parts of the journey that yeah. you can totally relate to. Like, yeah. oh, that's why we did this. Yeah. Or that's why I felt like this. And this is why, I, how yeah. I felt. Do you know what I mean? Because you can talk to as like as many people and try and explain as you're blue in the face. But no one's going to, even like my parents, they understand because they've seen it. They'll understand as best as anyone could because they've seen me go through it all. But they're never going to understand as someone that's suffering. I want to say it's that fear of like, I want to say it's fear of death, maybe. I don't know about you, but I, I've got a real... F- I've never had it before until mm. this situation. Just because death has never really been on my... You know, it's never been on my radar. Yeah. And now it's, no matter when it stares you straight in the face, yeah. you're going, okay, this is something I really need to deal with. Yeah. You know, it's a real possibility, whatever. We're all, we're all living and we're all dying, aren't we? Yeah. That's something that I've never really thought about until this journey. Yeah. And then, you know what? doing meditation in the mornings really really helped me mm. just it's just like i just listen to like a little cancer meditation in the morning and just imagine it like going out of my head okay. and like all the cells just like disappearing yeah so for me i find like a lot of solace in my faith so i pray yeah so that's definitely helped me and obviously the belief in like life after death and like paradise that helps me yeah because i'm like if i'm a good person i'm doing my prayers i don't have anything to worry about in fact can i ask you a question about yeah. faith yeah, sure. So, I mean, I'm a Catholic, so... Okay. Um, but I, I followed religion when I was younger, obviously up until a certain point, um, and then I just kind of, it just kind of fell off my radar a little mm. bit, actually. Um, but do you feel like... And it's probably a difficult question, so, you know, if you don't have to answer it. But do you feel like, with your religion, why did I get this? Why, why me? Yeah, no, I was, did. I really did struggle with that. Just, you know, you feel like... You can't, like, explain it. So I went through a phase where I did really struggle. You know, I still believed in God and all of that, but I did, like, have that moment where I was like, okay, but am I a bad person? Is that why these bad things are happening to me? Well, like, was there, there must have been, was the thinking, there must be a reason why this is happening to me. Yeah, so then... To share the story. 
yeah so then that's when I started getting stronger I was like you know I had the belief that you know God's got his plan for you it's written out and there's a reason behind everything there's a reason behind your struggle yeah. like I was saying to you about using your platform now I'm in a better place part of me thinks well maybe it had to be me because I'm going to try and do something and make something good out of this I'm yeah. not going to curl up in a ball and of course I'm going to cry of course I have my difficult days but overall I'm going to try and do what I can and yeah. if it doesn't help me like I said hopefully it will help someone else and like you said so maybe that is why it was me yeah that's really great yeah I mean she's nailed it <laughs> thank you so much for joining me thank you for having me Ugh, anytime you want to be a regular <laughs> yeah. I'd like to come back and do it. I'm actually. going to crack a really It's been cheese. really nice. Yeah, it's been so. Are you so going to say Clutch K? Oh, how uh, did he know you <laughs> stole it from me? That's so annoying. I was, Love I was, it. <laughs> You're very wanted around here. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you came. Please Oi. come again. Love it. <laughs> and let's hope we get up from this all, all time, time low. low. Love it. <laughs> Everyone has their fight, so let's ready our armies and let the battle commence because we're not going down without a fight. Like, comment, share and subscribe. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that.